Hello and welcome to the Shiki Science Show where as has been requested many times now in this video I'm going to talk about some of the work from the lab of Irina and Michael Conboy in particular focusing on their more recent work looking at neutral blood exchange. So to break this video down we'll begin by talking about where all this research started then talk specifically about neutral blood exchange and about the different components that can be found in the blood as well as taking a look at the results from these two studies that came out in 2020, one looking specifically at how this blood exchange rejuvenated the three different germ layers in mice, and then a second follow-up paper that focused a bit more specifically at the rejuvenation process on neurogenesis. So the best place to begin is probably where I ended a recent video discussing is aging contagious, because at the end of this video, once I'd argued my case for why aging could be considered contagious, I introduced you to the landmark 2005 paper, Rejuvenation of Aged Progenitor Cells by Exposure to a Young Systemic Environment. So in this paper conducted by the convoys, what they did was perform something known as heterochronic parabiosis, which is where you share a circulatory system, and they did this between young and old mice. And what they saw is that by exposing the old mice to factors present in the young serum, it showed signs of rejuvenation in their muscle and liver tissue. And so what this early work led to was the idea that there's something in the blood. And so well, what is in blood? Well, there are many different components that make up what you refer to as blood. Most obvious are your blood cells, including your red blood cells that carry oxygen around your body, in addition to white blood cells and platelets. But in addition, there's the plasma, the soluble fraction of blood, and it contains water, ions, proteins, nutrients, wastes, and gases. And so amongst this also includes hormones and other signaling molecules. These enable cells to communicate with each other, whereby one organ can release a signal, a hormone, directly into the blood, and it can be carried about all over the body to be recognised by specific target cells. So it's notable to mention then that one of the hallmarks of ageing is altered cellular communication. And further supporting the theory that there's something going on in the blood in terms of ageing processes is a study that came out in 2019, which effectively mapped the human plasma proteome across lifespan and identified different sets of proteins that have different trajectories across ageing, for example, either they increased or decreased. And the interesting thing was that it wasn't necessarily a linear process, but it was dynamic and non-linear. And so they referred to these changes as undulating proteomic changes, and I have a full video describing this paper, which only roughly 140 of you have watched. 10 of those views are probably me anyway. So I definitely recommend you checking that one out after this video. But anyway, back to the convoys. After their early work on heterochronic parabiosis, they were trying to identify what it was about the changes in the blood that were causing these rejuvenative effects. Was it something that was in the young blood? Or was it just the fact that the old blood was getting rid of some of the accumulation of these proteins? So the best way of thinking of it is a dilution of factors in the old blood by mixing it with the young blood. And this would be definitely desirable given the controversy with using young blood, especially in terms of translation to human therapies. And it would probably be more cost effective and safer if alternative methods were identified. So what they decided to do was investigate whether or not the same rejuvenative effects could be seen in the old mice if they simply just diluted the blood. And the way that they do this is through a process that they refer to as neutral blood exchange. So effectively what they do is they take out the blood from the old mice, not all of it obviously, and they spin it down and separate it out into these different layers of the blood which I described earlier. And so they remove the plasma and what they can do is replace this platelet rich plasma, so this top section, with saline solution supplemented with albumin. And so the reason that albumin is added is because it's the main protein found in blood plasma in mice and humans, making up around 50% of human plasma proteins. And in addition to this, it helps to regulate the osmotic potential so that when that plasma is reintroduced into the blood system, it doesn't disrupt the volume of the blood content. And so the way that this neutral blood exchange is performed in these studies is by replacing 50% of this platelet-rich plasma and then returning it isochronically to the animal along with red and white blood cells. So in this first study that came out in May last year, they performed this neutral blood exchange, which I'll probably refer to as NBE from now on, in both young and old mice. And notably, it was only done in male mice, which I'll actually come back to at the end. And both the young and old mice underwent one of these NBEs. And so once this had happened, they wanted to assess whether or not there was rejuvenation in the three germ layers. And the three germ layers refers to the three layers of tissues that form in our body 
originating from early development. So in this case, they looked at neurons, which is your outer layer. They looked at the muscle tissue, which is your middle layer. And they also looked at the liver, which is your inner layer. So the first thing that they assessed was the repair of injured muscle in the mice. And they did this by assessing four independent characterizations. For example, as you can see in these figures here, the neutral blood exchange in the old mice, so ONVE, resulted in the regenerative index more closely matching what's seen in young mice compared to old mice. Similarly, with the fibrotic index, the other data we're showing is how they also studied how muscle progenitor cells replicative potential altered when they were treated with either samples from human patients this time that had undergone the FDA-approved equivalent of MBU, which is therapeutic plasma exchange. And so here they took blood samples from human samples aged between 65 to 70 years of age, collected either before or after therapeutic plasma exchange, and then they added these samples to muscle progenitor cells. So this time obviously we're looking in vitro. And you can see here that on addition of the blood that was post the therapeutic plasma exchange, there's a much greater increase in the levels of BRDU, which basically stains for cells that are undergoing replication. So going back to the mice that underwent MBE, they next looked at the liver. And they showed, as you can see in this figure here, that the liver fibrosis reduced in old mice after a single procedure of neutral blood exchange. So after examining both the liver and muscle, they also wanted to examine whether or not the neutral blood exchange had an impact on brain hippocampal neurogenesis. And one of the reasons why they were interested in looking at this is because heterochronic parabiosis showed in this 2011 paper that it could promote adult neurogenesis in aging mice. And so what you can see in these figures here is that they stained the dentate gyrus for a marker of proliferation of cells. The dentate gyrus just being a region of the hippocampus. And so you can see in the old mice that had undergone this NVE treatment, there's more of these dots, which effectively indicates that there are more cells undergoing proliferation, indicative of neurogenesis. And so one of the proposed functions of the dentate gyrus is in memory formation. And so in this later 2020 paper, they looked more closely at how this NVE treatment could alter the memory of the older mice. And as you can see in this figure here, the older mice that underwent NVE performed similarly to young mice, in whisker discrimination, which assesses sensory processing, and also novel object recognition, where both sensory and memory information is being tested. And so I've only really touched upon some of the phenotypic data that they got in these studies, but what I think is more interesting is to examine their results that try to answer the question as to how are these effects being mediated? What is it about this NBE treatment that could be causing these changes? So if we go back again to this first study that came out last year, then we can see at the end of the study that they performed a proteomic array to assess the different proteins in the mouse serum taken from the mice before and after the NBE treatment. And so the first observation that you can make is that the profile of these different proteins in the old NBE mice has similarities to a young mouse profile in comparison to an old mouse control sample. But what I find most striking about their data set is that in the samples taken from the old mice that underwent NBE, they see an increase in the level of several proteins, suggesting that they've been upregulated, which may at first be counterintuitive given the fact that you've removed some of the plasma and just replaced it with albumin. And so at the end of the study, they propose a model to explain how the dilution effect of the MBE treatment can potentially be resetting the circulatory proteome. And so, okay, this looks a little bit scary, so I'm going to redraw it out myself and hopefully try and explain it at the same time. <laughs> Emphasis on hopefully. So in their model, they used the example of the TGF-beta family. And so TGF-beta proteins have been shown to increase systemically with age. And TGF-beta is commonly associated with upregulation of inflammatory signaling. In particular, it's been shown previously that TGF-beta could be acting to induce paracrine-induced senescence in neighbouring cells. But interestingly, TGF-beta proteins have also been shown to act as auto-inducers, so they can upregulate their own expression. So I'll refer to it from now on as A. So if we now try and plot a graph of how the levels of A change over time, then initially there'd be a decrease in the relative abundance of A due to the fact that it's going to be diluted by the NBE. And so proteins like TGF-beta have other proteins that they can activate through their signaling pathways and other proteins that they can inhibit. And these have their own feedback mechanisms that can result in impinging the activity of a, TGF-beta. 
And so this is where it gets a little bit complicated and why this should only be thought of as a model because in a real case situation, it would just be way more complicated. And this is definitely somewhat oversimplified and just hypothetical at the moment. So in this hypothetical situation, we have A, which could be TGF beta, auto-inducing itself, activating something the authors call C, which inhibits A. So we've got a bit of a negative feedback system going on here. And then another example where A is inhibiting a different factor, B. And so if we go back to the graph, as I mentioned, initially, due to the dilution, we have a reduction in the levels of A. And since A is activating C, you also see a reduction in the levels of C, albeit as a time delay to A. At the same time, we will also now start to see an increase in B. But as I mentioned, C is a negative regulator of A. And so if C starts to decrease because there's less activation from A, then that also means there's less repression of A. And so the levels of A will start to come back a bit. And then as the levels come back a bit, it can activate C, which then inhibits A. And then this is why you can get a bit of an oscillatory pattern. And then at the same time, we also have oscillating levels in B because B is getting inhibited by A, which is getting reduced, but then going up, back up again and down and up and down and up. And so basically B is the inverse pattern of A. And so depending on the protein in question, the time duration of these different events will vary in addition to the complexity of the interactions. And so the only way that they'd really be able to ever validate this model is to be able to take more time points after the NPEs taken place. But as they mentioned, fitting the model shown with experimental data on multiple time points after NBE for multiple proteins and multiple levels of regulation, so not just protein abundance, but also mRNA and signaling intensities, is a focus of their long-term work. And so NBE is just a version of therapeutic plasma exchange, which is already FDA approved and is routinely used in the clinic. So it's possible that you've already had therapeutic plasma exchange. And so along with their preclinical data in the study, they've also done a pilot longitudinal study with samples from several old individuals showing the impact of therapeutic plasma exchange. And so phase 2b and phase 3 clinical trials are being actively developed. And so this method in general shifts the paradigm from there being potential dominant factors in young plasma to instead showing that dilution could be sufficient, if not potentially better, to see beneficial effects. Now, I think there's a lot of work still to be done in terms of A, seeing what these potential beneficial effects are, and then secondly, to try and understand why they're happening. But I can understand that based on their data, it does seem quite promising at the moment. And I also think it's quite a clever idea in addition to the fact that by having such a such a dramatic dilution, it impacts so many different factors, which could explain why it's having impacts on multiple different tissue types. However, as I just said, the fact that it is impacting multiple factors, there could also be some potential negative consequences. For example, the blood is used to carry a lot of hormonal signals, and they only did the mice studies in males. And so the molecular mechanisms and consequences of doing this in female mice is well, at least I don't think it's been explored. And so that definitely would be something I'd be interested in knowing more about. And more on from that, there therefore could be certain times of the day or certain times of the month where it is more effective or safer to do so. And other interesting questions to answer would be, how long do the effects last? Does it have an impact on health span markers or biological age or lifespan itself? Um, so there's a lot of unanswered questions. I mean, obviously these things aren't necessarily cheap <laughs> to try and do experimentally, but probably suggest that before these are done, more proteomics and RNA sequencing should be done to really try and see what the immediate impacts are in terms of the changes in the protein abundance. So, so a lot to explore with this, but I do think given the FDA approval of therapeutic plasma exchange, this is something that, yeah, I suppose we should be quite excited about. So with that, I just want to quickly say that the first paper, if you want to know more detail about it, was covered in a journal club by Lifespan Extension Advocacy Foundation. So go check that out if you're interested. But as always, I hope you've learned something in this video. Thank you to my Patreon supporters. And as always, thanks for listening.